Homo habilis is the first species within our genus, um, of course, genus Homo. And when we're looking at Homo habilis, we are looking at a shift from a fruit-based diet of the Australopithecines and Artipithecus to a more meat-based diet, um, which is kind of going to be the basis for genus Homo. And when we're looking at that, we're seeing a shift in skull size, specifically in terms of teeth size, from a larger tooth to a smaller tooth. And that's going to result in less projection of the face um, in terms of our morphology. In addition to that, we're also going to start seeing a larger brain size as we move through genus Homo, starting with Homo habilis. Um, and that's coming off of either the early Australopithecines or something like Artipithecus, um, which has about a 350 to 400 cc brain. Um, to Homo habilis, which with our smaller specimen here is about a 510 cc brain, to our larger specimen, which is about 775. And if I scoot these over and bring in Australopithecus here, you can see that the skull size, let me take the mandible off just so that we can have them straight here. You can see that the skull size on our Australopithecine is actually bigger, but we're looking at this brain size here. The other thing that we're looking at is the projection of the face. So when we're looking at that facial projection, if you're looking here, you can see how the front part of the face projects because of these large teeth. So we're projecting forward at about a 45 degree angle. If we make those two throws parallel to the ground, um, we're seeing that 45 degree angle here. When we're looking at Homo habilis, we don't have that 45 degree angle. We have a much shallower angle because we have much smaller teeth. So if we compare the teeth of these two specimens, you can see how the Homo habilis here is much smaller tooth-wise, which then results in a lot less projection of the face when we look at these guys in anatomical position. So here you can see that Homo habilis does not project nearly as much as our Australopithecus, even though their brain sizes are about the same in terms of size-wise. Then if we compare our smaller Homo habilis to our larger Homo habilis, you can also see here that the face does not project nearly as much as it does with our Australopithecine. So again, with our Homo habilis here, we've got a increase in brain size up to about 510 to 75, 775 cc's and a reduction in tooth size, which is going to result in lesser facial prognathism or projection. That is caused by the change in diet. Now the thing with our change in diet to a more meat-based diet is that we're starting to see what we consider a feedback loop within evolution, where we've got bigger brains, so we're more intelligent, so we can make better tools. The better tools allow us to access other foods, which allow us to get more calories. More calories lets us get a bigger brain, which makes us more intelligent, which makes us get, make better tools. So it becomes this feedback loop through time of a larger brain. And that's all has to do with availability of calories. So Homo habilis are our smallest species. Um, they're also our earliest species. And then we're going to move through Homo erectus, archaics, neanderthals, and modern Homo sapiens. Homo erectus is the second species that we're going to be talking about in our evolutionary lineage or that we're going to be focusing on. Now, oftentimes you'll see Homo erectus split into two species, Homo ergaster and Homo erectus. And when we do that, we see ergaster as the earlier specimens and the specimens that are pretty much can, um, only in Africa and Southern Europe, whereas er, um, erectus then is in Africa, Asia, and down into Java. For our purposes, for lab, we're going to go ahead and lump ergaster and erectus together. And the big things that are going on with Homo erectus is we have a big increase in brain size. So I'm going to pull in Homo habilis here for a second, just so that you can see the comparison. So both of these are erectus, and then here's Homo habilis. So if you remember, Homo habilis has a brain size 
from 510, which is this specimen, to about 775. Whereas with our Homo erectus, we're seeing about 900 to about 1100 cc's in terms of brain size. So a big increase in brain size here. And that's coming from better tools. Okay. Remember we talked about big, more technology, more calories, bigger brains. That's what we've seen here. So they've changed tool technologies, allowing them to go from just eating bone marrow to eating more meat um, within their diet um, and therefore getting a bigger brain. And that brain increase occurs over time. So the earlier specimens have more of that 900 cc brain, the later specimens more of that 1100 cc brain. Now there are a few features that are very specific of Homo erectus, and it's a group of features that we call the cranial buttressing system. And it's a thickening in various parts of the skull. So we'll start here with the brow ridges, the supraorbital torus. You can see how thick those brow ridges have gotten um, with Homo erectus. You can see kind of that thickness there. Um, we see a thickening on the back of the skull. It runs right across here. That's called the nuchal torus. And again, that's to offset pressure. So all of these thickenings offset pressure on the skull. So the supraorbital torus, the nuchal torus. Then on the top of the skull, we've got a thickening here. Let me turn this around for you here. So if you can kind of see on the top of the skull how we have this lump, runs from the front to the back. We call that the sagittal keel. Um, and again, it's just a thickening. It's not the muscle attachment point that we've been seeing with the australopithecines, um, where the muscles would come up the side and then attach, this is just a thickening to offset pressure. Um, so it, it's just a lump, not doesn't come to a, that sharp edge the way a crest does. Those three features together um, are what we call the cranial buttressing system, and we see them in the African fossils, the Asian fossils, the Chinese fossils, and the Javanese fossils. Now there is one additional torus that we see only in the Javanese fossils, and you'll see that on this guy right here. And it's on the side right here. It's this lump um, right here. It's what we call the angular torus. Uh, it's kind of hard to see. Let me see if the other side's a little easier. There you go. You can see it a little easier here. Um, so you can see that angular torus that's running right above the mastoid process on the temporal bone. Okay, and it's running right to that nuchal torus on the back. But we're only going to see that feature in the Javanese Homo erectus. Now the Chinese Homo erectus have a specific feature as well, but it's not in, linked with the cranial buttressing system. It's linked with the teeth. And what we see with these teeth is we see what's called a shovel-shaped incisor in the Chinese Homo erectus. So instead of the incisor being blade-like, um, it actually curls in on the sides of the tooth towards the tongue. So it becomes kind of a scoop shape. Um, so Homo erectus is characterized by the larger brain size, again 900 to 1100 cc's, and that cranial buttressing system. And that group of traits including the large brow ridge, the sagittal keel, the nuchal torus on the back, and then in the Javanese fossils on the side, that angular torus as well. After Homo erectus in time, we move into a group that we call the Archaic Homo sapiens. So Homo sapiens sapiens is our species and subspecies as modern humans. Homo sapien neanderthalensis are the Neanderthals. And we have several other subspecies like Homo sapiens heidelbergensis, um, etc. So we've got a whole bunch, adulti. Um, they're, they're all modern Homo sapiens in that they could interbreed with anatomically moderns, but they're more of an archaic um, type. So Neanderthals are the one that we're going to focus on. Um, so the scientific name being Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. And as you can see here, we're getting bigger in our brain size. Um, Neanderthals actually have the largest brain size, even compared to us, um, the largest brain going up to 1600 cc's. Um, averaging for Neanderthals at about 1,500 cc's. Um, the rest of the archaics are closer to 1,200 cc's. Um, and then, of course, modern humans are 1,400. So we're seeing that increase through time in brain size. Now, Neanderthals are going to have a grouping of traits that are similar to what we see with the cranial buttressing system in Homo erectus, in that 
we're going to have a thickening on the back of the skull here. Now this time, because it's tall, instead of just that narrow ridge, we have this big kind of lump on the back. Um, you can maybe see it better at this angle, where we've got this big lump back here. We call that the occipital bun. And it serves the same purpose as the nuchal torus, being to offset pressure. Um, and we still have a relatively large brow ridge here. You can see that brow ridge is still pretty big. It's not as big as what we saw with erectus um, or with some of the other archaics, but definitely still have a definitive brow ridge. Now, if we look at the top of the skull here, the other thing you can see is that this brain size angles back, this brain shape. So from the eye orbits, we're still angling back, kind of giving this skull a football shape almost, where it's widest from the top to the bottom in the middle, and then it tapers on both sides. The projection, remember we still have less projection than what we were seeing with the Australopithecines, so less than a 45 degree angle to our um, face, so the face is still reducing in size. Uh, another feature of the Neanderthals is their nose here. Do you see how wide this nasal opening is? Um, what we're seeing then is a very, very large nasal opening, meaning that they have a really big nose. And what that does is it helps warm up the air because Neanderthals are living in a very, very cold climate. They're living during an ice age in Europe, okay, in the Middle East. So very, very cold. We really need to warm that area before it makes it into the nasal cavities. Now, as part of that larger nose, they also have larger sinuses. So right here, the face projects forward. So coming from the cheekbone onto the nose, the zygomatic onto the, the maxilla, this area here is enlarged. It's pushed forward. And we call that mid-facial prognathism, okay, or mid-facial projection. So instead of the whole face angling forward, the cheekbones push forward, okay? And it just makes a bigger sinus area in this area, again, allowing for that air to warm up more before it makes it into the lungs. Now, as we see that, it's gonna pull this part of the face forward, which means on our lower jaw, our lower jaw is going to angle forward as well. It's gonna pull those teeth forward. Now it's going to cause then a space to form behind the last tooth right here before this piece that comes up. So we have this space right here. We call that the retromolar space. So group of traits for our Neanderthals, we're going to see that occipital bun, the enlarged nasal opening, the mid-facial prognathism, and this retromolar space. Those are going to be our traits that are indicative of the Neanderthals. The last species in our lineage that we're going to be looking at is anatomically modern Homo sapiens, which is us. Now, right here I have both the Neanderthal and a modern, just so that we can do some, some, com some comparisons um, between the archaic specimen and the anatomically modern specimen. Now, if you remember with the Neanderthal, we talked about the really large brow ridges, and you're going to see with the modern that those have reduced quite a bit. So we no longer have those large, large brow ridges. Um, we have some slight ones. We still have some brow ridges, but not nearly the big ones that we saw with the Neanderthals or Homo erectus. We've also lost that occipital bun and nuchal torus, so no thickening on the back. The muscles back here are getting much smaller. And this all has to do with an improved tool technology. Um, the teeth are getting much smaller, allowing the face to be much more vertical. It's not projecting forward. We don't see that mid-facial prognathism. The nose is small compared to our Neanderthal here. Let me pull the Neanderthal back up. And you can see, let's see if I can get him in the right orientation. There you go. Um, you can see how much larger of a nose the Neanderthal has here. Um, you can also see that that nose um, projects forward and that nasal area, um, the sinuses right here are reduced. Another thing that's really important about modern humans is a change in shape of the skull. So you can see here, we have much more growth in this frontal region, and the brain is coming up instead of straight back, like what we saw with our Neanderthal here. So we're getting much more of a rounded brain shape versus that more football shape that we saw with our Neanderthal and our Homo erectus. Lastly, has to do with the chin. So if we move over to the mandible here, 
Um, of course, we've lost that retromolar space. We don't have a big gap there. Um, this one looks like it has a big gap, but if you look closely, you can see that there should be a tooth there that's fallen out um, of this fossil. But if you compare these two, you can see that the Neanderthal, um, while having much smaller teeth than some of the earlier specimens, still has pretty big teeth when compared to modern humans. Um, you can see that change. The other thing, lastly, is the chin itself. So let's see if I can get an orientation here. You can see how the chin projects forward, angles forward. Whereas with our Neanderthal, it's pretty much straight up and down. All right, so projecting chin is another feature that we see with modern humans. So two main features um, show up first with modern humans. One is this projecting chin, and the second is this um, brain growth in the frontal region, so more of a vertical forehead um, versus a slanted or sloped backwards forehead like what we've been seeing with the Neanderthal here, where it angles backwards, it curves back versus going more vertically from the eye orbit. Um, and again, this all has to do with tools. So we improve our technology. We no longer have to process our food with our teeth. Um, now we're processing our food with the tools. There will be another video that's just on the different tool technologies of the different species. So this video is going to look at the different tool technologies of the um, species within genus Homo. So starting out with the earliest is the Oldowan tools, which is what we see here, Ashelaean, Mousterian, and Upper Paleolithic. Now what we're seeing here is Oldowan stone tools being a very, very basic tool, simply a rock that's got a few chips taken out of it. And the purpose of this is just to get one sharp edge. This sharp edge then can be used to break open bones and access the marrow inside. So Homo habilis would take this tool, would take a bone, set it up on a rock, kind of at an angle, take this tool and just hit the um, bone, would it break the bone open, allow them access to that marrow. So this tool here is being used for secondary scavenging, allowing them to access food that no other animal can access, for example, a pride of lions takes down an antelope, they eat their fill, they leave. Then hyenas and vultures are going to show up as the primary scavengers, eat everything that they can. The hyenas will even eat through like the rib bones and some of the smaller bones, leaving the big bones because they can't crush through them. So that means that Homo habilis can show up after they've all left, grab those femurs, the humeri, the big bones, crack them open and get at that marrow inside. Now this is more calories than any other food source that they have access to at the time. It's a really important food source based on just a very simple tool. Now over time they got better and better at making tools and eventually started making tools that look like this. This is called an Ashelaean hand axe. Um, it's worked on both sides so it's what we call bifacial. Um, it's worked on both sides, comes to a point. Okay. And what we're seeing with this then is a multi-purpose tool can still be used for the same thing the old one tools were for breaking open the bones, but it can also cut. It also has a cutting surface, allowing um, Homo erectus, who manufactured these tools, to actually access more than just the bone marrow on a carcass. So they went from being more of a secondary scavenger to more of a primary scavenger. Now obviously this is not a hunting tool. They're not using this to take down an antelope. They're still scavenging with it, but they can now use it to scrape the hides, maybe to make some sort of clothing, um, and I use that term loosely, more of like a skin covering to start making some rudimentary shelters, um, but much more advanced tool than our basic old one. So Ashelaean, this is what's being used by Homo erectus and a lot of the early archaics as well. Um, prior to Neanderthals. Now the later archaics, including Neanderthals, are going to use these kind of tools. These are called Mousterian tools, and you can see much more advanced. We still have, you know, workings on both edges. But what's different about these tools is if you'll notice this back, it's very smooth on one side, but worked on the other. So same kind of thing with this one. We've got more of a smooth edge on this side and more worked edge over here. 
So with our Ashland tool here, we would have one big rock and it would make one tool. With these tools, the Mousterian, we have one big rock and they're fastening the sides of the rock, taking a chip off and instead of moving to make the whole core one tool, they're using the flakes, the pieces that come off of the side and then working them into a tool. So this then could be hafted onto a stick and become a spear point. Um, it could become a knife blade used to cut or to scrape. Okay, so various um, uses for the different tools. So they were manufacturing different shapes and different types of tools. Old one, one very simple tool, Ashelan, all the tools have this same shape. Now that we're getting into the Mysterian, the more advanced, we're seeing different tools for different tasks. And that's kind of the important thing here is each tool has its own purpose. Lastly, we're going to get into what we call the Upper Paleolithic, which is of modern humans. With modern humans, we're seeing faceting on both sides, kind of back to what we were seeing with the Ashlean, but much more refined. So you can see this is a knife blade or a spear point. Uh, much longer, much more refined in terms of um, the fracture patterns. Um, eventually moving to um, better ways to haft, to attach it to that handle, to that spear, and eventually becoming more projectiles. So going from a spear that you would stab with to a spear that you could throw, eventually um, using things like atlatls as um, help for projection um, to throw things, as well as bows and arrows, um, eventually with modern humans. So. Oldowan, that's going to be our Homo habilis, Achillean, Homo erectus, Mousterian, much more advanced, um, Homo neanderthalensis, and lastly with the Upper Paleolithic for modern Homo sapiens.